Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai, e hia ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Ko te te rangi te maunga, ko wai au te awa, ko ngai tamate rangi ngā te hene wai atarua, me ngā te whaita, ngā hapu, ko ngā te kahungaru, ngā rauru, me ngā te raukawa, ngā iwi, ko rangi āhua te marae, ko meri wai pao pao te tipuna, e kaipu tahi ranga hau a hau, ko Kim Hamilton taku ingoa. Welcome all and thanks for joining us this morning. I'd like to acknowledge the community groups and NGOs from throughout Aotearoa and also to those from government agencies who are looking for insight to inform your work. I, I acknowledge those who are joining us from other countries around the world and we appreciate that this is a time of many challenges for community organisations and Fano. What Martin Tolich and our co-chair Garth Nolan Foreman have to present today is really relevant to how we can work to ensure that community research organisations and efforts are aligned to supporting our goals. Throughout the webinar, we invite you to log into the Community Research Facebook page to post any questions for Martin and Garth today. You're also welcome to use the Q&A function in our uh, Zoom meeting and also chat. If you want to be notified when we're broadcasting our next webinar, please join our Facebook page and the Community Research Discussion Group you can subscribe to our monthly e-news by emailing communications at communityresearch.org.nz. In our webinar today, we have a chance to learn more about what we can do as community organisations and in our research and evaluation to consider ethics and standards of practice. I want to shamelessly promote the work of our organisation, Community Research, and towards the end of our webinar today, we'll be having our co-chair, Garth Nolan Foreman, speak about our recently updated code of practice, so today is the official launch. We're also exploring the changing nature challenges and opportunities to ensure that our research and evaluation maintains ethical standards by hearing from one of the founders of the New Zealand Ethics Committee, Martin Tolich. The New Zealand Ethics Committee is an ethics advisory committee serving any social researcher not eligible for ethics review from the standing um, ethics committees and tertiary organisations or the health and disability sector. Many research projects from professional and community and government researchers fall outside of the narrow realm of uh, university or health research. And members of the New Zealand Ethics Committee are incredibly qualified and talented volunteers with significant research and ethical review experience. So I'd like to begin by uh, introducing Martin Tolich, whose first degrees were from Auckland University and his PhD in sociology was from the University of California, Davis. He is currently Associate Professor in Sociology at Otago University in New Zealand, and Martin has authored and co-authored numerous books on research methods and research ethics for Pearson, Oxford University Press, Rutledge, and SAGE. His latest books were Planning Ethically Responsible Research, The SAGE Handbook of Qualitative Research Ethics, Public Sociology Capstone Non-Neoliberal Alternatives to Internships, Social Science Research in New Zealand with Davidson, and his forthcoming book with Rutledge is Finding Your Ethical Self, a guidebook for novice qualitative researchers. He served on ethics committees for over 20 years and in 2008 founded the not-for-profit not independent New Zealand Ethics Committee. In 2012, he gained a Blue Sky three-year Marsden grant from the Royal Society of New Zealand to study the tensions around ethics review. And Garth Nolan Foreman will be presenting uh, our updated code of practice and Garth, is well beloved by the community sector across Aotearoa. He's a strong advocate for our sector knowing better and chaired the first collaborative study of the non-profit sector in New Zealand as part of the John Hopkins International Comparative Study of the non-profit sector. He was deputy chair of the New Zealand Third Sector Research and is long-standing chair, as I said, of community research. He's widely written on sector issues and he has um, led a government policy unit worked in the Cabinet Minister's Office, was National Director for the Australian Council of Social Service, and for 20 years developed curriculum and taught part-time in Unitech's governance and leadership programs for the not-for-profit sector. Now as a Director of LEAD, Garth brings extensive review and evaluation experience to the team. He's conducted major reviews for the Lottery Grants Board, New Zealand Agency for International Development, the J.R. McKenzie Trust, Christchurch World Service, uh, Christian World Service, and Community Waikato, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Martin Tolich, to share your kōrero about ethics and the New Zealand Ethics Committee. Nga mahi nui kia koe. Kia ora. Thank, thank you for that lovely welcome. Um, and uh, 
So um, I want to talk to you today uh, for about 20 minutes or so about the origins and new directions. This is a it, New Zealand Ethics Committee is a committee that can, uh, that uh, it is evolving and completely uh, reinvents itself uh, periodically. And I, I think today our relationship with, with a community research is part of a, part of a new direction. But we'll talk about the origins of where we've come from uh, also. Um, you, you can find us on uh, the website uh, and there it is there. You'll also see that there's an application fee of $500. We have just got a grant, uh, which I can't tell you where, where it's from, but we just got a grant. Uh, and uh, so there, for the next six months, applications are, are, are free um, to, uh, to come to the New Zealand Ethics Committee. Uh, we, we really want to... We want to build capacity. So COVID has really uh, affected um, research in New Zealand, and it's and we have the capacity because we we review all of our applications online during Zoom, uh, and we interact with people on Zoom. Um, but the number of applications that have come to us have dropped from about seventy per year to about thirty five, and I, I think we want to. Re we, 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 want to, we want to increase that back to 70, but also get it up to about 100 and actually start to really um, sort of build the capacity of research ethics in, in this country. Um, today, we're, we're also being part of a, a really exciting launch of the Community Research Code of Practice. And I just want to pick up on one line uh, that's in that Code of Practice. And there's one word in that code of practice that I want to highlight, and that is to develop, culture, cultivate, and maintain principal relationships uh, is integral to ethical practice. What I want to talk to you today about is relationships. And what I want to say to you is that the New Zealand Ethics Committee is a different ethics committee than you normally deal with. We want a relationship with you. We want a re re relationship as you develop your research project, as you as you seek ethical guidance from us uh, during the review process. But we also want to be part of. We, we want to be part of the the research as you go forward. And I'll be talking about that today. So that's what New Zealand Ethics Committee wants to be part of that relationship. It doesn't want to be a dominant part of that part of that partnership, but actually. Uh, something that, that contributes to the, to the betterment of, of research and also ethical research in New Zealand. A couple of years ago, there was a, there was a talk that New Zealand Ethics Committee might, um, might dissolve. And the feedback from, from various other ethics committees was that, that we were so much part of the fabric of New Zealand research that we really couldn't, couldn't go. And, and we, uh, we, we, we gained funding uh, at that time. I want to give some historical background that Kim's already really talked about uh, where we've actually come from. Ethics in this country came from the unfortunate experiment uh, at National Women's Hospital. Um, and unfortunately, um, there was a, there was a, the, the response wasn't good. The response was an institutional response. And it basically said, Herbert Green, you taught at, you taught at Auckland University, you taught and you worked at, um, at the National Women's Hospital, those two sectors need to get their house in order. So the tertiary sector and the, uh, and the hospital boards needed to come up with ethics review. So that's why we're really limited to ethics review in New Zealand. Um, there wasn't a national response like there is in Canada or Australia, where there's a, a national statement. So all researchers can actually adhere to a national statement. Um, we don't have that in New Zealand. So really, um, Ethics review uh, is quite limited in, in New Zealand. So some personal background to me, I, as I got, I got my PhD from the University of California and I came back to Massey University, joined the uh, Human Ethics Committee, became deputy chair of that committee and very quickly moved on to Manawatu Wanganui when it was spelt that way, Health and Disability Ethics Committee. And then that was uh, destabilized and I went on to become uh, I was appointed by the Minister of Health to be the chair of the Multi-Region Health and Disability Ethics Committee. So this story really begins there, because when I was the chair of the uh, Multi-Region Health and Disability Ethics Committee, researchers would, would approach me and say, oh, could you just look at our application? We don't, we, we, we really want to go through uh, a ethics review, but there's nowhere for 
um, for us to go? Will you just look at our application? And the answer was no, I couldn't because we were in this very narrow, uh, very narrow sector. So um, when I what, I, what I actually have, what, what I actually saw was that there was an ethical vacuum, uh, an ethics vac vacuum in, in, in New Zealand. So I got together with um, some uh, chairpersons of the who were uh, forming, who were re retiring from the, their own health and disability, disability ethics committee. And I started to form, think about forming an independent New Zealand ethics committee. And we got funding, $25,000 from the Tyndall Foundation. We got a seeding grant from the Ministry of Social Development that got us, got us started. So why do we need money? We don't need money to run the, run the committee because it's all voluntary. We have a secretary, we, we pay that person. But our main, um, our main cost is the annual retreat that we have. And we get down and we start to, and we'll be having one of those in February of next year. We start to sort of, again, think about what sort of ethics committee are we actually, are we, are we like any other ethics committee or, or, or are we different? Um, so that, that's, that's what we need funding for. So as I said, I had former HTEC chairs and committee members joining. Um, and currently the committee has 14 members, six of them are Maori, and all of them have PhDs. Everybody on the committee has PhDs. What we really need, what we really need, and I'll, I'll talk at, at the end of this talk today, is we really need community members. So if you don't have a PhD, we'd really like to hear from you. Um, you know, we just, you, you just, ethics is about ordinary people um, saying, hey, that's not right. Uh, and uh, and currently, as I say, we're, we're basically overqualified. So we've written a couple of papers about ourselves. Uh, Jane Marlowe and I wrote a paper uh, uh, in 2015 and 2017. And this first paper, um, we, we came, this, this first paper mentioned here, this unconventional powerless ethics committee, is that, well, we're an ethics committee who actually seek, seek, to, seek to be powerless. No one in New Zealand has to come to us. No one has to, people that come to us don't have to listen to us. Everybody does, but, but they don't have to. We want to be part of that relationship uh, during the formation of the project, but also down the, down the line when, 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 when things happen, come back to us and, and talk to us. And I'll talk about that uh, later on. So these are articles that you can read about who we are. And currently uh, uh, we have two members of the committee who are writing a brand new uh, article about who we are and uh, what we actually look like. So, um, so you, you 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 might be asking why do researchers from NGOs or community researchers come to the New Zealand Ethics Committee when it's not compulsory? Well, he, here's some of the uh, th this is the, these quotes are coming from the uh, from the papers that we we um, that, that I just mentioned. We wanted to do this right. The person said, we needed to know that our project was sound and we needed to know that it was ethically valid, I suppose. So people wanted to use the committee to actually test uh, the validity of, of their, their ethics. They wanted somebody, somebody else to be a dispassionate person to say, hey, this is, um, this is ethical or this, this is not. This other person said, um, I think because you're going to go through an independent ethics committee, uh, you do try to make sure that you've got set up everything properly rather than trying to wing it. So it, so it does put the more rigor into how you're setting up everything. So people are talking about rigor and about dispassionate um, opinions. Um, one of the things that gripes researchers, probably like you, um, is, is that sometimes ethics committees talk about methodology and they tend to think of methodologies off limits. And we actually put it into the into the process. We actually put it into the process and actually comment on the methodology, especially especially for junior researchers from from community groups. Who uh, I've just got an e email this morning from a from a from a community group who says, "Will you help us write a questionnaire?" Yes, yes. Send us your questionnaire, and we'll help you along. And uh, and if I if, if if I help that person, I'll make sure that I'm not part of the part of that uh, group that actually reviews it. So this, this person said that the review itself gave us some good ideas in terms of tweaking the survey to become more balanced. So it definitely enhanced the, the, the design of the study. But this next quote talks about not only 
going through a review, but coming back to us. So the further we got into the project, we realized the survey actually wasn't meeting the need out there. So we revised the survey. So that meant going back to the ethics committee and informing them. That's actually where we got the most help around the questions and how they were framed. But the, the convener gave quite a lot of really good advice around uh, that and that made us make a few changes. So we're, we're really, really there to be involved in people's research. Um, but we also respect that a lot of researchers coming to us are very experienced researchers and don't need um, that sort of level of, of, of help. My favorite quote of all time uh, is, we ask people, why do you come to the New Zealand Ethics Committee? And this one here really, I feel we honored and really valued our research participants who were very vulnerable people. Uh, more, more, and we were able to demonstrate that because we had gone through this extra process that we didn't have to go through. We did it because we wanted to make sure that we, we weren't unconsciously or accidentally being exploitative or in, inappropriate in any way. So I kind of kind of felt that going through the, in, the ethics process was an in, with, with an independent ethics review um, that wasn't linked to how good it would make the university look if we did this research. It really helped us feel stronger about what we were doing and yeah, but we felt that it was a way of valuing our participants. So this is really about, this is not only a relationship with researchers, this is a, this is a relationship that New Zealand Ethics Committee can actually have a relationship with, with um, participants. So um, now, community researchers have problems with institutional e ethics committees because because of a power relationship and also a, a sequencing of, of, of events. And institutional ethics review really, uh, ethics committee, committees want you to come to the ethics committee first to get approval before you go and actually talk to the community. And we, we're the opposite. We want you to go and talk to the community and then come back and we will, we will help you with your ethics review. And I think, I, 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 I think when people are doing um, uh, action, action re research, or um, uh, or participatory action re research. They, they, this sort of uh, this sort of sequencing can actually be quite problematic. We don't have a problem with that. We want to be with you uh, at at w whenever you want us to be there. Um, so, how do people use the? Uh, how do people use uh, the New Zealand Ethics Committee for all the reasons above? But the one I love the most. I love the most is sometimes we get an application from from a researcher and it's clearly unethical it's clearly unethical and the researcher has put it into us and we'll say to them well we kind of like think that this little part of it is unethical what you're actually wanting us to do or uh, well, what you're wanting to do and they'll say yeah thank you very much i'll go back to my boss i'll go back to my boss and tell them that so they're actually using the ethics committee to actually have a relationship with their boss who's telling them to do something and they've been through universities and they know how how research is to be ethics so we, uh, is to be ethical and so we, we can actually use that um, uh, we we can be there for that person too so um if i have a takeaway message i haven't finished yet but if we have a takeaway message from today um even if you don't go through an ethics committee um have a reference group, form a reference group. These are people who you start the research project, you, you get it out, out into the field, and then, um, and then things happen. Things happen in the field. Um, and um, thing, the, the, the project can, can go pear shape. If you can have a dispassionate group that you can go to who aren't part of your research and actually say, hey, what should I do in this situation? Many times, many times, uh, researchers use the Eth New Zealand Ethics Committee for that purpose. They actually come back to us and say, hey, something's happened, something's gone pear-shaped, and what do we do? And uh, I, I want to tell you about one, one, one occasion where um, uh, this has gone, uh, has research has gone um, pear-shaped, and it's Dan's story. Dan, Dan was a, a young man, and he was part of a longitudinal study of rural youth. And at the age of 11, 14, and 17, Dan shared his stories, his views on school parents growing up in a rural area and other stuff. 
and the interviews were tape recorded, transcribed. His parents consented for Dan to take part. He gave, he gave assent. Not a problem. There's no problem there. But um, when the researchers contacted Dan, Dan when he was 17, they discovered that he'd passed away. And this was a big, we call this a big ethical moment. What should the researcher do? What should the researcher do with what? What should the researcher do with the tape recorded and transcribed data? Obviously, obviously your heart goes out to the parents. Surely they would be, they would take, the researchers would take the beautiful tape recording and transcripts that Dan had shared with them at the ages of 11 and 14 and give them to his parents as mementos. Obviously that's what you would do. Of course you would, you would, you would go out to the mother and say, hey, we have these, this, this voice and we can give it to you. But there's someone out there there's someone out there listening to this right now and says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And what's that, that's what we want on an ethics committee. We want someone to say, hey, no, that's not a good idea. That's not, have you considered Dan's perspective? What about Dan's privacy and about the stories that he told uh, and would have told about his relationship with his parents and his siblings? Should we also protect Dan's privacy and his relationship with his parents? So this is a, this is a big ethical moment that one should need a a reference group and these these researchers did have a reference group uh, they actually went and talked to the and well, what should we do but there's no right answer here there's no he he or uh, the the researchers need to do this and that so if you're interested in 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 this article here they wrote it up in a book that i published on qualitative uh, ethics in, in, in practice and the, the notion of ethics and practice means um, it's not procedural ethics or formal ethics, but actually the ethics that actually happens in the field. Uh, and that was an article and that they actually explain what they did, uh, which I don't have time to talk about now. But, but you can see that these things happen that were not predicted by the researcher or the, or the ethics committee uh, during the... Uh, um, so, so I've just written a new book uh, that uh, Kim talked about and... Uh, what, what I do, what I do, I won't go to the next slide yet, but what, what I do in the first day of class with, uh, with students is they, I go in with a tape recorder like this uh, and, I, and I turn it on and I turn it on and uh, uh, can I turn it on? Yeah, see, it makes a noise. And then um, when, I, when, I, when I go re record, this little red light comes on and I put it down. I put it down. Uh, I got five students sitting around me and that's what I, that's what I do. There's the tape recorder right there. And I say to them, hey, welcome to quality. This is the first thing I say in this class. Welcome to qualitative research ethics and your first day in graduate school. This is 2016. And as you can see, I've turned on the tape recorder. So let's begin. Like, let's just begin with the class. And I've turned a tape recorder. Hmm. Do you need our permission to turn that thing on? Someone says. And I, I totally naively say, why would I need that? I think she wants to know if you need our informed consent. And I say, wow, all this ethics in less than 60 seconds. So in a, in a sense, rather than going into a class and saying to these students, I'm going to teach you about ethics, you know about ethics already. And I think ethics committee need, need to realize that, that, that researchers know a lot about ethics. But the other thing is, do, do these students have the courage to actually challenge the, 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 the teacher on this, on this case um, and, 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 and say, hey, that's not, um, that, that's not ethical. Um, so I left the room. I left the room at that stage and said, "Do you guys want to write a journal article?" And actually, right above, you can actually see the journal article that uh, 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 that all of that those five students wrote with me uh, in a really high impact journal. So, if you read a book uh, that I'm that my, my next book, this is the first page of, of my new book, and the whole thing is about is about puzzles that get people to realize that they actually know a lot about ethics and we just need to get people to be talking about them. So, okay, um, new directions for ethics. Um, I think that we need to be really thinking about informed consent. Um, is, it, is it a good concept? It's a great concept, but, and we also say that participants can leave the research at, at any time. Um, is that enough? Maybe we actually need to say to people, well, at the end of the research, do you still want to be part of the research? Do you still consent? So we can actually talk about talk, talk about uh, informed consent in, in very, very, 
very, very ongoing ways uh, so that the relationships would, would actually last. And I, I won't go to the next one, but to, to the limits of confidentiality, the limits of confidentiality, the first thing I wrote about ethics in New Zealand was, hey, uh, if you're going to say something is confidential, you're in a small town. And if you're doing community research, you're in a small town and don't trust confidentiality. There is real limits to it. And you need to be really, really careful uh, about, about this. So I, I think um, next, next year, I hope to go around uh, various provincial towns and give talks to community research uh, about about new directions in ethics and talk about my my book. So um, lastly, this I think it's the last slide, uh, the New Zealand Ethics Committee origins and directions. We're here to fill a vacuum. There is a vacuum uh, and anybody who who is not in the health sector, which is shrinking and shrinking uh, at the, at its ethics review and uh, who doesn't who doesn't belong to a tertiary uh, sector can come to the New Zealand Ethics Committee. Mm -hmm. We're here to, to help. It is not compulsory. You can take our advice or you don't have to take our advice. We're creating a different powerless ethics committee that is actually part of a, a relationship with you. And ethics is part, is part of a re relationship. So in the next, the next year, the New Zealand Ethics Committee wants to facilitate training for researchers um, and um, on, on research and also research ethics. But we also need new blood, new membership. It'd be great if community members would, would want to write to the New Zealand Ethics Committee, say, I'm, I'm thinking about joining you. And if you don't have a PhD, you'd really, really be welcome. Uh, we really have enough people with, with PhDs, but um, uh, it would be really good to, uh, to um, so thank you very much for this chance to really come out and say, hey, we've been around for 10 years now, but this is the first time we've actually come to your group and we, we, we want to be part of your group and we want to be a relation, in, in a relationship with you. So Kim, I'm going to leave it there if I can. Kia ora, kia ora Martin, that was, that was fantastic. And I've, I've um, pocketed about five or six key questions that have come through in the session, which I'll pass over to you shortly. I forgot to mention when I introduced you, Martin, that you were going to co-present today with Dr. Lily George, who unfortunately had to pull out. Um, well, hopefully she's got a brilliant book coming out um, next year on Indigenous research ethics, or no, actually it's just been launched. So we hope to have her on soon to talk about that. But I'd like to um, cross over to you, Garth, to um, launch, officially launch our, our uh, Community Research Code of Practice and then we'll come back to these questions from participants, if that's okay. Kia ora. Kia ora, everyone. It's great to be here and uh, uh, great to uh, hear uh, Martin's uh, story about the New Zealand Research Ethics Committee. Um, the, it's, that's a really important area that um, I, I don't know whether, if it's unique in, in the world. Martin might know something about that, but uh, I think it's definitely adding something uh, some real value to uh, research ethics in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, community research, the Tangata Whenua Community and Voluntary Research Centre, uh, when it first started, of course, was faced with the, with the concept of what is community research? Um, it's possible to define community research as what is being researched, the community, or it's possible to define community research as who is doing the research, uh, community organizations researching. Um, but from, uh, from our origins, uh, we decided to define a community research approach, um, the how research is done. Um, and therefore, uh, right from the beginning, we've had a community research code of practice, which is uh, we've used to help define us um, and to uh, highlight what we believe is distinctive about a community research approach. Uh, our, our very first co community research code of practice was much longer than the version you'll see today um, and uh, was very earnest, as we all were, um, and uh, uh, was actually less colourful than the one you'll see today as well. Um, so uh, after about a decade, uh, we have come back to look at 
uh, the code of practice and revise and refresh it uh, to make it simpler, to update it, um, and hopefully to make it more accessible to people. Uh, so the idea is that um, if, uh, uh, if this code is both for people undertaking community research and for community organisations who want to uh, hold researchers accountable. Because if the whole code could be summed up in a phrase, it's that uh, well-known um, phrase, nothing about us without us. Um, the, the code is about embedding the concept that uh, uh, we know ourselves best, um, what are the issues, and we need to control our own knowledge uh, and make use of it for ourselves. Um, so we've summarized this in the new version under four key PO or concepts, Fanonatanga, which of course is about relationships. Um, and you'll see on the screen in front of you, the key elements underneath that about establishing and maintaining relationships, free prior informed consent, and the rights and roles and responsibilities of all those involved. Rangatiratanga, which is about who has control, the governance, the decision-making, collective ownership, and of course in New Zealand, how this acknowledges te tiriti o waitangi. Uh, the third key concept is about manakitanga, uh, the care and support, uh, the values behind it, um, that we value the little gifts of knowledge that uh, are given by community um, through mechanisms such as accountability and koha, and that the whole process is seen as an active, one of active learning. And uh, the, the final of the core concepts is kotahitanga, which is really about um, uh, collectively sharing the results, having the impact, putting it to use, uh, so that it's about the benefits and the sustainability of the research. And the fifth concept really is how these four uh, are applied. And it's the idea that they should be embedded across all the stages of the research from its design through its implementation to how the results are used. Um, the, uh, uh, the, so the research is summarized in the one page that you've got in front of you. Um, and that's supported by uh, three or four other pages, which uh, spell out in detail each of those concepts that I've just uh, briefly covered. We hope this will be uh, a more useful format. Uh, the ideas behind it haven't changed, but we have, we hope, refreshed and updated um, the way we've packaged this so that it's more accessible. Uh, both to researchers who are wanting to be respectful of the communities they work with and to communities to hold researchers accountable. So uh, it's available uh, on our community research website, communityresearch.org.nz. Just look up there for code of practice. It's hopefully easy to find um, and you can download it um, and uh, use it from there at, at any stage. And uh, hopefully it will be uh, make our research uh, more useful and more ethical. Kia ora. Kia ora Garth, thank you for that. Um, look, the other thing I did want to mention is that community research are often looking for people, researchers and people to upload their community research or their research about communities with communities. And one of the expectations of the uploaded research is that the research will have been undertaken using that code of, you know, adhering to the code of practice. Um, because obviously we're not in the business of promoting unethical research or, um, but I'll, I'll come over to that because one of the questions from one of our participants um, was to you, Martin, really about if there's no obligation to follow the ethics committee advice or feedback, what happens when, you know, what happens if this happens and the research is unethical? Well, the, the, this can happen, this can happen with a, with a, the, the research is approved or unimproved uh, or not approved. Um, and um, um, 
yeah. researchers sign an indemnity uh, agreement with us, so they take okay. out our advice, but they are actually uh, indemnifying the, the the committee for a for, for any sort of future lawsuit, which of course has never never mm -hmm. happened. In fact, I, I don't I don't think of any lawsuit that's ever been brought against the New Zealand Ethics Com any New Zealand Ethics Committee. But I, mm -hmm. I think it's a really good question, um, and I, I think ethics really comes down to trust, really, and. Uh, you know, we we actually come to an ethics committee, and we we the application is reviewed, and the researcher is sent off on their way uh, with a trust relationship that, that that they will actually follow um, their um, uh, what what they've told the the ethics committee. But I think it's a good question. Mm. Thank you, Martin. I've got another question from Shabnam, which is, what is the turnaround time for ethics review from the committee, please? Cool. Uh, we we meet once a month uh, around the you know and it's it's good to know what the sequence is. Uh, like the last the last Sunday of the month. So I think the next the next the next meeting is on the twenty fifth of uh, November. And if your application is to us within fourteen days of that, it'll be reviewed by the committee. Uh, well, what often happens is that when an application is sent to a um, to the New Zealand Ethics Committee, a researcher will receive an email back from the lead reviewer saying, I don't understand this. Could you explain this more? Mm -hmm. So rather than a niggly issue being brought to the, to the committee, I don't know well, what they're talking about. We've actually had a sort of a dialogue with the, with the researcher from the lead researcher. So um, the turnaround time is if, if, you're, if you're two weeks before I would say within a week you would hear from us um, that your research was approved. But because we've actually dialogued with you before, uh, that, 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 that will facilitate uh, a speedy review process. And I, I, I like that idea. This is something that, that this, is not, this is not New Zealand Ethics Committee's idea. This is Unitech uses its idea and Stanford University also uses that idea too of, of, of receiving an application and responding to it. Uh, immediately and sort of seeking clarification for for something that that's not not clear and that really speeds things up. Thank you, Martin. Um, so another question here is, uh, how did you establish your practice guidelines? I guess for reviewing ethics, or you know, have you drawn on? I guess the question is, where where have you drawn on this? Has it been from other universities, institutions? Can, how how did you come at come at your framework for analysis around ethics? There, there's been a number of studies of how ethics committees actually operate. It's very rare for a, for a researcher to get into an ethics committee to actually observe them. Um, but one, one researcher, Laura Stark in, at Vanderbilt University in, in the States, she got into an ethics review, uh, uh, ethics review committee and actually observed how they practiced and how they used the code of ethics. They never used the code of ethics. They never opened up their, their code of ethics. They were actually using a sort of a common law uh, technique where they, well, two, two meetings ago, we said that, and to be consistent, we should say that. Um, so in a sense, um, in, a, in a sense, ethics committees may have codes, but uh, they, they really actually open them and actually use them. So um, the New Zealand um, Ethics Committee uh, adheres to the Royal Society guidelines on it. Okay. Thank you, Martin. So I've got another question from um, Catherine who wants to know, do you provide ethics review for government agencies? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, we, we, I, I, uh, yes, we, we have good relationships with the Ministry of Social Development, with the, uh, with the New Zealand Police, with the uh, uh, Health Promotion Age Agency, um, that's just the name three, and, and I, I could name another three, but I, I just can't can't remember them all. Um, but yes, we 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 review those applications, and uh, but they're always good because they always pay the five hundred dollars. Most community researchers come in and pay some sort of koha, but um, yeah. but uh, so yeah, so we certainly do government agencies, uh, and um, we really like that, and. Yeah. Um, but but also but also we sort of always sort of said to the government, um, you know, you can actually set up your own ethics committee for government researchers, and can we help you with that? Can we actually facilitate that with you? Um, and uh, so yeah, um, 
certainly will we will we take will we take uh, applications from from government agencies. Thank you, Martin. Um, I have a question from uh, actually. There's a couple of people who have asked about joining as a lay person and contacting admin. I'll post a note, an email address into chat shortly. Um, somebody else added local government. I'm assuming what applies for central government would also apply for local government, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and it had a question around: Do you need ethics prior to establishing an ethics reference group? No, no. I, I, I was, I was actually. Uh, what I was actually saying there is if you don't go through ethics, if you don't go through an ethics uh, re review process, at minimum form an advisory group. And I, I think what one of the chat, chat rooms actually used the word advisory group. Mm. And I think ha having an advisory group is really important. And no, they don't need uh, mm. ethics approval. You really just want dispassionate people to say, hey, that's not right. Mm. Um, so you know, if you were if you were responding to Dan's story, would you go with the? Oh, you must give it to the mother. Oh no. Well, what about the privacy of, of the kid? There's mm. there's there's a debate there, and you need to inform the researcher, and the researcher needs to sit back and actually listen. Thanks, Martin. I've got another um, question around uh, a couple of things really. One is is there some sort of checklist, and that that people can go to to kind of do a self-review prior to submitting any applications or getting in touch and the other one is you know is there a process for i guess it's the same reviewing low risk research we don't we don't make a distinction between low risk and, and high risk we, we just we just take any application that sort of comes towards us uh and the re, the, the researcher has their own motivation uh, their own motivations to sort of coming to sort of see us so uh is there a checklist before a lot of times, the 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 the, the researcher will contact the 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 the, uh, the the chair of the committee and start to have a dialogue, and I think that's where you get a check a checklist. Um, and you know, well, one of the things that I'd like to actually do, I'd actually do is um, is to have exemplary applications put on online so researchers can actually do that. Um, and actually, I actually have a site. I have a site. Um, if you look up, if you type in the word tread ethics, tread, T-R-E-A-D, uh, ethics, you'll actually come to a, a website that I created with my master's grant um, at Oxford University. And, and at that place, you'll actually see uh, countless um, people's ethics applications that are all online. You can read them, you can, you can, you can, you can uh, copy them, you can um, modify them uh, and, and put them in. What's really important is that I find so many researchers going to, oh, this is a really good question, Kim, about what is the checklist. I actually see so many researchers turning up to an ethics committee and getting the application and it's a blank piece of paper. How do I fill it in? Well, go to TRED, TRED, T-R-E-A-D. It means the, the Research Ethics Application Database uh, at, uh, at Oxford okay. University. And you, you'll see 30 or 40 um, ethics applications that you can actually read to see how, how scholars have actually put forward and thought about an e ethics review. My favorite one there, Kim, is a study of photo voice, photo voice, mm -hmm. which is a camera, uh, photo voice um, of uh, sex workers in Portland, Oregon. Now, Portland, Oregon, uh, sex work is actually illegal. So, you know, my God, how do you do research on that area? Go to that, go to that, uh, uh, that tread website, and you'll find that the researcher has thought everything through to the to the nth degree. So, that's a really good question about the checklist. And I, I think I think the checklist is, is to read someone else's a application. And I, I think. Um, I think the New Zealand Ethics Committee and also community research could actually do more to, to put up exemplary examples. Um, uh, there's a question here about, do you work with um, da the Data Ethics Advisory Group at all? That's a government, a government group. I guess data's, data, big data is quite a big issue at the moment, so. It is, it is. You know, I think we are sort of, um, we're, uh, we're, thank you very much for the for, for that website. There it is, right, right, tread right in front of you. Um, I I think we are, I think we're a little bit skewed. I think we're a little bit skewed towards social science research, especially qualitative research, survey research. So 
So big data, big data, um, big data research that that doesn't come to us. That doesn't normally come to us. And we, uh, and what else doesn't come? Uh, we do health research in terms of uh, people's attitudes to health. But if you want to put a pill in someone, we don't we don't touch it. That's mm. that's that's that sort of health research. So there are so there are things that we do and things that we don't. But yeah. I don't think we've done any big data. But that's a very 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 important issue. And uh, and there's some really excellent people out there like Tim Deer at Auckland University mm. who who knows the ethics of that very well. So um, recently I've been made aware of um, some government or government research grant funded work. In fact, there's probably lots of examples out there where the research has been undertaken, but government agencies have suppressed, I guess, the results of that research, despite it being taxpayer funded. So they've never been publicly released. That seems to be a common practice. Is there any way in which a group like the New Zealand Ethics Committee could help advocate for the release of research for public good? Well, one, one of the questions that we have on the application form is, is how is this information going to be disseminated? So we, we would pick that up at, at, that, at that point and we would, and a researcher, a, a, a researcher who, who had a sense that their employer was going to, um, that their, that their employer was to um, censor that the, the document could actually say that right there and we would we would pick that up and we would it would not be ethical it, we wouldn't consider it to be ethical to collect the data and waste people's time and then that the, the data just gets put into a drawer um, so that wouldn't pass muster for us I guess sometimes the person who's undertaking the research is different to the person who's commissioning it so that decision making isn't always sitting with the researcher. I guess that's yeah. the point. Yeah. So is there any avenue, I guess, to, um, to address that as an ethical issue? No, uh, uh, it, it, I, would, I would need to see it in front of me uh, to, mm. for, uh, rather than an abstract question. Yeah, that's fine. Um, thank you. Uh, there was a question around, do you come under any uh, pressure from political I guess, um, political parties, is, is, is that the question? Is, is, are you seen as politically neutral, I guess is the positive way of rephrasing it? Or are you under pressure from other groups to um, guide what you do? I, I don't think they even know that we exist. <laughs> Good place to be under the radar. <laughs> but, um, if, but if you'd like to find a, a political organisation that wants to fund us, they'd, they'd be most welcome to do that. Uh, you know, we don't yeah. need we don't need money. We we, yeah. we have sufficient money to uh, to exist for the next three years. So. That's fantastic. We've had a couple of people um, who have uh, are keen to uh, contact you directly um, to also maybe get a bit of a steer. From, uh, is there somebody they can phone, or should they just go through the website and make contact that way? Uh, they should. They should they they should uh, contact me directly and my okay. email is all lowercase martin dot t o l a c h at otago dot ac dot nz. Fantastic. Um, so I guess in New Zealand um, we often well I've been on a few ethics committees myself and a lot of people struggle with including or excluding particular groups um, because they don't feel either that they have the cultural competency as a researcher to, for example, engage with Māori communities or, you know, they're going into communities that they're not naturally part of. Um, do you guys pick up those sorts of issues and how do you assist with helping them deal with those? those Absolutely. Dilemmas? We have two questions, two questions are on the application form and, and what, how does this research impact Māori and all research mm. impacts Māori in, in, in New Zealand? And, uh, and also we would be asking them what sort of uh, consultation process ha have you begun or who would you con consult with? You know, there, there are six, six Maori members on the committee. So uh, we, we want to facilitate that. We don't want to, yeah. I wrote an article years ago called Pākehā Paralysis. Uh, I, I, don't want, I don't want this to be a, a source of paralysis. I, I want this to be facilitating the inclusion of, of, of all peoples into New Zealand research. So um, I might let you have a little bit of a chat, um, Garth, because you've done a fair bit of research and evaluation. Are there particular styles of research and evaluation, Garth, that you think 
um, are perhaps easier to approach in an ethical way? Right, <laughs> that's, um, that, that's a big question. Um, the, uh, one, one of the things that I was um, uh, thinking about, um, which maybe answers your question or maybe doesn't, um, is the, uh, uh, we often uh, make plans to include the people being researched at the, uh, at the design stage and the, the data collection stage. Uh, but one of the things that I've been playing with uh, more recently uh, after being encouraged by reading an article about it is this uh, a, a concept called data parties, mm -hmm. which are where you invite the people along to the sense-making stage of the research as well so that you try and involve as many of the stakeholder groups in um, making sense of what has been collected. Um, you know, and saying, you know, what do these messages, what are the main messages coming out here? And being much more inclusive in, the, in that sense-making stage, which uh, previously, at least for me, uh, and maybe for many other researchers, has been a kind of um, more lonely stage um, of uh, trying to do that by uh, by oneself, and I find this both um, uh, um, engaging and uh, stimulating. Uh, you get more ideas, um, and I think it's also uh, a good way to hold yourself accountable to to the groups that you're working with and the inter and the other stakeholders who have an interest in in the research. So um, yeah, the, the, that's an area that I've been trying to explore more recently. Yeah. And also calling it data parties tends to attract more people than calling it data analysis, I've found. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great, uh, that, that's great. And I think, um, you know, the more involved participants in the research are in the analysis, the write-up, the confirmation of findings, the better. Um, Davinia has a comment, I guess, and somebody might have a comment on this. Um, about research requests coming through where ethics has been granted over the proposal, but the questions have not been signed off. And her feeling is that um, questions and questionnaires should go through ethics often because of the vulnerability of some of the participants. Does anybody have a view on that, please? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's essential. Uh, the, the questionnaire and also the interview questions in qualitative, uh, the qualitative uh, interview questions and also the questionnaire need to be, um, need to be, um, um, need to be read because um, they can really, um, uh, are, they, are they leading questions? Are, are the questions, um, my, my favorite is to do a, if you're doing a questionnaire of the military, and you start to put gender and rank in there, you actually just, you basically can actually name the person you're actually talking mm. about. Um, so I, I think reading, reading the questionnaire is essential. H having such someone, someone outside read it uh, is, uh, you really, you can't, you can't give ethical guidance w w without seeing the whole project. Yeah. Um, well, I guess one of the things I noticed is that there were a heck of a lot of uh, there was a heck of a lot of research going on during the lockdown and um, it was often really difficult to find out who was commissioning the research or the surveys um, and uh, I was a little bit concerned about a what the information was going to be used for there were often there were no caveats or disclosure about how they were being used and you, you it's often not apparent who's funding it um, how important do, do you think these are from an ethical perspective and yeah yeah, I, I saw I saw a lot of a lot of research on students uh, conducted uh, during the lockdown, and I'm sure that that was good good research and and, and with the, with the with the res with the students in mind. But there's also a student fatigue. Uh, there's also a participant uh, fat fatigue. You know, I want to if if you go back to the if you go back to the Christchurch earthquake uh, back in 2011. Researchers came from all over the world to Christchurch because it was basically, you know, that, that everybody spoke English and everybody wanted to research how, how communities were responding um, mm -hmm. to the crisis. Um, 
and a lot of research took place there without without any um, without any ethical review at all. So during during crisis times uh, like COVID, uh, like the disaster, um, uh, 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 researchers should know about the New Zealand Ethics Committee that 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 we 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 can actually review things rather quickly uh, in, in an expedited way uh, during during a disaster. Um, I'm going to ask you for final comments. I mean, one of the things, yeah, no, I'll ask you for final comments, please, Martin, if you've got any kind of reflections on the session or challenges to people out there. I'm embarrassed that 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 we've been we've been research uh, we've we've been doing an ethics review for ten years now, and this is the first time we've actually uh, put our hand out to, to, towards you. And I I want to be I want next year to to, to actually. Uh, continue on uh, in this engagement, and I saw one idea uh, put up in the uh, the question and answer was could a community uh, uh, re research uh, group member join the, the board of the New Zealand Ethics Committee? That's a good idea. We we need to have a have a stronger relationship. Thank you, Martin. Well, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Garth, have you got <laughs> any final comments, please? Um, I think I'd only say the embarrassment is mutual. Um, <laughs> The, uh, and uh, I'm already committed to making sure that uh, we give some prominence to uh, the New Zealand Ethics Committee on, on, our, uh, on our family of websites. Um, the, I, th I think there's a paper in our collection about the New Zealand Research uh, Ethics Committee, uh, but I, I think we need to uh, promote it as a tool that's available to support people and researchers in this field because um, uh, the kind of people who are involved in our networks are often not associated with tertiary institutions or um, uh, or hospitals, district health boards, um, and this is a great resource. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all our participants for your questions. A lot of really positive feedback around the session. Um, you're why we do it, people. So thank you very much for engaging. Please note that, um, that we will take additional questions if they come to you in the middle of the night. So put them up in our Community Research Facebook discussion group and we'll try and respond to those in the next few days. I'd like to mahi to Martin and Garth for sharing their wero, their whakaro, their whakaro rangatira and inspiration with us today. We've got challenges and opportunities to reimagine and build the communities and nations that will support future generations to thrive and reach their full potential. And we cannot lose sight in that in our research and our approaches. So on the 30th of November, we've got a webinar focusing on New Zealand Pacifica research and evaluation, um, featuring Dr. Edmund Fehopo and our, one of our amazing board members, Annalise Robertson. And they'll be sharing insights into the challenges and opportunities of Pacifica research and evaluation and working with our communities. And we're also looking at developing a community research Pacifica um, response strategy uh, to help grow the, grow the capability and capacity of the sector. So yeah, all comers to that, please. Uh, please join our community research Facebook page and the discussion group. Again, you can subscribe to our monthly e-news by emailing communications at communityresearch.org.nz. And thank you again for joining us today. A copy of the video will be a video copy of the webinar with Garth and Martin will be uploaded to share with your colleagues and friends uh, later this week. And I'd like to thank you again all for your time today. Nga mihi nui kia koutou katoa. The Community Research website offers a hub for good community research and researchers. It's the place for the public to find and share evidence about effective community practices. The website collects research and evidence and organises these so that they can be easily accessed and used by other groups. You can access this research and browse by category, by a list of quick link topics, or by searching for something specific. All of the research is free to download. The community research site is all about excellence and effective practices. You can view recordings of past webinars and find out about future ones. The webinars share evidence about what's working in the community sector. Published by Community Research in 2007, the Code of Practice provides the standards and guidelines for doing research. It's the place to start if you're thinking of undertaking research with or in a community or iwi.
As well as the collection of research, we keep a register of experienced researchers who are skilled at working with iwi and communities. To find a researcher who can help you, we have a filter system which allows you to find people based on location, qualification, ethnic group, and area of expertise. The Community Research website is a unique resource for the community sector to use and share. It matters because communities who learn well will do well. It matters because it evidences what's working for us. For researchers and community people alike, we've made it as easy as possible to share your research on our website. Kowa e Fakama. Uploading material is quick and simple. Save your work as a PDF and head over to Share Research. Answer a few questions that help us tag and organize the research so it's easy for people to find. If you're a researcher and skilled at working with communities, you can add your details to the directory of researchers so that you can be found. Community research keeps you updated and informed. This helps make you more effective. If you want to stay updated about the latest research, informed about new resources and our upcoming webinars, head over to sign up for our e-news on the home page. Community research is a rich resource built for and by the community. For it to reach maximum potential, we rely on you to contribute, participate and support the resource to grow and thrive. Mā te kotahitanga e ora ai tātou.